Today's video is on central pattern generators, or CPGs. After watching this video, you should be able to do the following. First, you should be able to describe the characteristics of a central pattern generator, or CPG. And second, you should be able to design an experiment to determine which of the two main types of CPGs an experimental animal has. In the last lecture, we talked about how a person with a spinal cord injury can no longer have voluntary movement. It turns out that if you take an animal with a spinal cord injury, like a cat or a rat, in some certain circumstances it can still walk, although it does not have voluntary movement. If you take your spinally transected animal and partially support it by like a harness on the belly and you put it on a treadmill, you can start the treadmill and the animal will start walking. You may be wondering how this spinalized animal can walk. It does not have any descending drive from those upper motor neurons to initiate behavior, but it turns out that the spinal circuits left have all the neurons necessary to start a rhythmic walking behavior. This group of cells is termed the locomotor central pattern generator, or CPG. You do need something to get the central pattern generator started, so it turns out sensory input from the moving treadmill can get it started in some animals, like cats or rats. There are many different types of central pattern generators, or CPGs, that mediate a variety of rhythmic motor movements. For instance, chewing, breathing, and swimming if you're a fish. You can also record what's called fictive locomotion in an isolated spinal cord. You first have to add neuromodulators like NMDA or 5-HT to get the fictive locomotion started, just like you need to move the treadmill to get the locomotion started in a spinalized animal. So if you take out your spinal cord and then place electrodes on the L2, or lumbar 2, lumbar 5, right and left ventral roots, so those contain the motor neuron axons, you can record alternating behavior, shown here. So the bursts are activity or activation of the motor neurons in that root. In the L2 root contain the flexor motor neurons, and in the L5 you have the extensors. So if you look, just on the right side, the flexors and extensors alternate back and forth. Similarly, that alternation occurs between the left L2 flexor and extensors. And you, have, you also have alternation between the right L2 and left L2. Okay. So that back and forth alternation is similar to what you would see if you recorded from muscles, the flexors and extensors on both sides of the body, when an animal was walking. These isolated spinal cord experiments provide evidence that there's a spinal cord locomotor CPG. Surprisingly though, we do not know exactly which cells make up this locomotor CPG. We know that the lumbar and thoracic spinal cord are necessary, but no one has been able to pinpoint the exact cells that make up the locomotor CPG. Figuring out how the locomotor CPG works is a very active area of research due to the many clinical implications of treating patients with spinal cord injuries. A few features of CPG-controlled locomotion are well known. It's known that supraspinal or brain structures are not necessary for the basic motor pattern. The rhythm is produced by neuronal circuits that are contained entirely within the spinal cord. And like I said, it's in the lumbar and thoracic portion of the spinal cord. These spinal circuits can be activated by tonic descending signals from the brain, i.e. the start of locomotion can be signaled by the brain, but those descending signals don't contain the rhythmic pattern that they evoke in the spinal cord. And finally, spinal CPG networks don't require sensory input, but are strongly regulated by that input. So sensory information from your proprioceptors can shape the locomotor behavior. While sensory feedback is not necessary for the locomotor pattern to be generated, as we saw with that isolated spinal cord preparation, it does play a very important role in normal locomotion. 
Sensory feedback controls the timing of the different phases in the step cycle. It shapes the pattern of muscle activities within a step cycle through reflex pathways to motor neurons. Sensory feedback contributes to excitatory drive of the motor neurons. And sensory feedback also contributes to long-term adaptation of locomotion, especially in development, since you get better and better with your locomotor pattern as you get older. Compare your walking pattern to that of a two-year-old. There are two major forms of rhythm generation. The first involves pacemaker neurons. Pacemaker neurons, like the red neuron shown here, have endogenous bursting activity. They fire and then stop firing. This endogenous bursting activity is due to the membrane properties of the neuron. If you couple an endogenous burster neuron, like this red neuron, with a green tonically active neuron, you can get rhythm generation. So you see, when the red neuron is on, the green neuron is off. When the green neuron is on, the red neuron is off. An example of this type of rhythm generator can be found in the vertebrate respiratory central pattern generator. One of the options for your swimmy CPG is an endogenous burster. The circuit is shown in your swimmy lab manual and reproduced here. In the endogenous burster CPG, you have an endogenously bursting cell here, X. So even if you only recorded from X, you'd see this bursting on and off of activity. If you hook up X, an excitatory cell, with A, which is just a normal neuron, you can get A to fire at the same time that X does. If you then excite an inhibitory interneuron on a tonically active cell B, so if you had no inhibition and B was just on its own, you would always have firing in B. Now you have inhibition when X is on, so there's no firing in B. When X turns off, then you get your firing. If A and B are your motor neurons, now you can get your alternating rhythmic locomotor pattern. The other form of rhythm generation involves emergent synaptic interaction based rhythms. So if you have two neurons here, red and green, that fire non-rhythmically in isolation, if you hook them up with reciprocal inhibition, they each have an inhibitory synaptic connection on each other, you can start to get this alternating on and off behavior between the two neurons. This type of rhythm generation is used in the CPG that controls the leech heartbeat. This form of rhythm generation is used in one of your swimmy CPG options, the mutually depressing inhibition oscillator. This type of oscillator is shown below. If you have two tonically active cells, X and Y, you can hook them up with an excitatory synapse onto motor neurons A and B, and you can also have an excitatory synapse from X and Y onto inhibitory inner neurons which synapse onto the opposite cell. So X excites an inhibitory interneuron which inhibits Y, and vice versa. You can get oscillating behavior if you have synaptic depression at the synapse between Y and its inhibitory interneuron and X and its inhibitory interneuron. So if X is firing, Y is going to be inhibited until there is enough synaptic depression at the interneuron between X and Y so once it, the synaptic depression occurs, then the inhibition on Y will be removed, and then Y can start firing. And Y fires until the synaptic depression between it and its interneuron is enough that it removes the inhibition on X, and then X starts to fire again. Since X is hooked up to motor neuron A, A will fire when X fires. Y is hooked up to motor neuron B, so B will fire when Y is firing and you can get this alternating locomotor behavior. That concludes our video on central pattern generators. Hopefully now you're able to describe the characteristics of a central pattern generator. And you're also able to design an experiment to determine which of the two main types of CPGs an experimental animal has. In fact, you'll be doing this with the Swimmy Lab.